I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes. Brown will be moderating tonight, but I'm just getting us started. There is two rules that we apply here to the college. One is uh, no personal attacks, and the second is uh, we don't insult each other or each other's mothers. Oh. <laughs> The next thing I want to let you know is that for those of you who are not Mr. here, Rule, this one fool at a time. All right, one, yeah, fool. Right, okay. Mr. Rule, one fool at a time, and I guess I'm the fool up here right now. All right, we start off with a brief announcement period, then our speaker will speak, then we'll go into a question and answer period. Generally, about 9:45, 10 o'clock, we'll, we'll go into our infamous rebuttal period. And just a reminder, we go or what we say, uh, blamage of extemporaneous oratory started. Oh, Rob. Rob. Tim gave the introduction already. Give it away. Good. All right. Yeah, so we're going right to turn on the video yeah. first. So, All right. Okay, then so you sit down. Without any further ado, we'll hear it all. Sit down. Our first speaker. Come on. 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 So this is working? Yeah. I have no idea what these two mics are doing. They're just like looking at me. Okay, this is just, okay, we're recording all you uh, All right, well anyway, um, my name is Ben Jarofsky. I'm a writer for the Reader newspaper here in Chicago. I believe this is the uh, second time I've addressed this group on the subject of TIFFs. I believe this is the third time I've discussed TIFFs in this very restaurant. Uh, not including just occasional lunches or breakfasts here where I rant, come to rant on, on the subject. Uh, I was here for a group of, I believe they were libertarian free market types. And, uh, we were in this room and um, they were sort of uh, appreciating what I had to say from a different perspective, the taxation issue, which, of course, was probably what uh, sparked my interest in TIFs in the first place. So anyway, uh, what I'm about to say will probably be a repeat of what I said the last time, uh, both to your group and to uh, the libertarians, and what I tend to say whenever I um, talk about TIFs, which is all the time, I've sort of become known for a program uh, that I have nothing to do with and uh, would like to see him blow up. Um, so, uh, I know how you do things here, and uh, I, pres I prefer to get right to the questions uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so, I'll just give a really brief overview, which I scribbled uh, when I was sitting back there listening to the announcements. And I'll start with just a very brief explanation of what tits are. Very brief, so brief that um, I'm sure the, during the questions I'll get asked the inevitable question of how they work. Uh, but anyway, a TIF, uh, Tax Increment Financing, is essentially uh, an economic development program uh, in which property taxes are diverted from the, body, the taxing bodies that consume them, the schools and the parks, etc. It to fund projects that presumably, and this is in the abstract, this is the way the program is supposed to work, that presumably would not be funded but for the TIFs, that the projects are so risky uh, in neighborhoods that are uh, low-income neighborhoods where few projects have uh, taken root, that you need some sort of subsidy or assistant, assistance to get a developer to go there. So that's the first presumption that but for that TIF, but for that subsidy, there would be no development. Uh, the second uh, assumption, and this sort of gets at the woman who talked about the uh, Albany Park Library, um, is that the investment that all these taxing bodies are making by allowing this developer to get the money that would ordinarily go to them, in other words, would ordinarily go to the schools, will then finance development that will bring in more property tax dollars in the future. So it's essentially an investment. The schools are making this judgment, presumably, this is what they're supposed to be doing. They're saying, we are willing to give up a million dollars now to fund this project that wouldn't ordinarily be funded with the idea 
that in 20 years, that property will be bringing in twice as much money. So it will be a shrewd investment that will pay off for us. So those are the two presumptions uh, embedded in the whole abstract notion of how TIFs are supposed to be. Of course, Prory doesn't work that way at all. What can I get for you? In no way. It's a complete mutation of that abstract. And so, to me, TIFs have come to sort of symbolize pretty much like everything that's wrong with the way our local government works. Uh, the program is built on a lie. They tell us it's not a new tax, when of course it is. They tell us it's intended for the poorest of poor neighborhoods that but for that TIF financing would not get any projects when the lion's share of the money goes to some of the wealthiest neighborhoods where projects are being developed all the time without any subsidy. They say it's overseen by independent boards and watchdogs who are free of any kind of political restrictions and are only looking out for what's in the best interest of the citizenry, when of course it's overseen by a series of rubber stamp boards filled by people who were put there by the mayor who knows that they'll do whatever he says. So there is no independent oversight whatsoever at any point anywhere in the program. They say it's going to help schools and parks when in fact it diverts millions of dollars away from schools and parks. It doesn't really help them at all. Uh, and then there's what I call sort of like the ripple effects of the program uh, that impact sort of the way we view government. Uh, to conceal the program, they essentially lie to us on our property tax bills and tell us that it doesn't take money, when in fact it does. So if you look at your property tax bill and you live in a TIF district, it'll say zero, when in fact, of course, who knows? It takes much more than zero, obviously. In some cases, it takes up to 90% of a, or 100% of a tax bill. It has an impact on all the other budget issues that we face, distorting our notion of how these things are happening or what's going on. For instance, last year, the city of Chicago claimed a budget deficit, I believe, don't quote me, I think it was $600 million is what they were saying, something there. And as a result, they had no choice but to cut back the libraries. They were going to cut Monday service. They were going to bring back the pages so that they had, had already fired so that books couldn't be put away. And it was up, coming upon librarians who were supposed to be there to help you find books and materials to put the books away. They said they couldn't do anything about it because we had a $600 million deficit. Well, what they didn't tell us was there's like about a billion dollars in TIF reserves sitting in banks. So because it's a shadow budget, because it's not part of the official budget process, because they tell us it's not even a tax, it's not even on our tax bill, it completely distorted our debate. It wasn't a realistic debate. How could you say we absolutely positively have to cut libraries when you have a billion dollars sitting in reserves in the TIF funds? Similarly with the Chicago Public Schools, I forget where we are right now. It seems to waver from one month to the next and what the deficit is. Let's say I believe it last was 700 million. Again, don't quote me on that. I can't keep all my millions together. Same situation. How could we be saying we have to, uh, we were saying, uh, cut keep the teachers from getting that last year, the 4% raise, uh, have no money uh, for extra the extra time that the mayor wants uh, the teachers to spend, no money to hire new teachers or have art. There's no art or music in the school system in Chicago, no drama. So how could you say we can't afford these things when you have these hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in reserve? We distorted the whole process, uh, the whole budget process. We can't have a real honest discussion because we really don't know how much money is available because there's so much money just sitting in reserve off budget. Uh, the final point that I want to make about TIFFs and would have been, I, trust me, I do not want to see this video, but um, this video was put out by the city of Chicago. I believe it's called What is a TIFF? And of course, it's a complete and utter distortion of what TIFFs are, how they work, what they do, how they're funded, what they go to fund. And it's sort of like La La Land bears absolutely no relationship to anything that goes on in the city of Chicago, particularly how they run their TIF program. But essentially, it's our government's notion of about what 
you, the citizenry, can take. You're not that bright. You're easily confused. You don't really want to understand it. Your eyes are glazing over just by the discussion of it. So we're just going to lie about it. And you'll be happy because you're just essentially a happy people. And I'm not a very bright people. On my worst days, I actually share that opinion about the Chicago City. <laughs> Sorry if I offended anybody. Nobody in this room, of course. <laughs> so anyway, the whole program has come to me to sort of symbolize sort of the general helplessness of the Chicagoan, the Chicago voter, who just sort of wandering through life in a daze, confused by what's going on and always bewildered. It reminds me of the conversations I heard people have in the 70s when we imposed the lottery. People would say to me, or they'd say to each other, Why are the schools so broke? I thought the lottery was going to save that. And of course, it was just money was being shuffled from one fund to the next, wasn't going that much. So, anyway, that's sort of my 101 on tips. Hate to be so bleak and gloomy. Um, I would try to make a TIFF joke, but I can't really think of one. <laughs> At the moment, this being Saturday night. Maybe it was a Thursday night. I didn't anyway, that's how I see it, so I'll take your questions. Question. Uh, so, am I the one in charge of pointing out the people who say questions? Ryan Bloom. 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 Ryan Sort of by the shadow, uh, these shadow accounts. Yes, sir. How does how does daily selling out the parking meter increase? Is that did any of that money go into this billion dollars? Is that billion dollars separate from that? Yes, it's completely separate. That's the problem with Chicago finances. There's all these different accounts, um, but you shouldn't. The the TIF program is completely independent from the parking meter program. With the parking meter, where they sold the parking meters and put that money again that was supposed to last forever. Uh, forever didn't last very long. Uh, so they're two separate things. So again, I, I'm saying rough billion dollars. It's uh, I don't know exact number. I saw it in the paper actually just recently in the Sun Times, but it's roughly a billion dollars in reserve tip money, which they have not spent yet. So it's just sitting there. So in some ways you could say it's a really brilliant program. It's like a rainy day program. I, mean, if you look, I actually made this up once, um, trying to look on the bright side of tips. I will not argue for tips. I'll do both. Okay, I'll do that. Anyway. Um, so you could say that, but um, I don't know what they're using the money. Originally I was absolutely convinced that Mayor David was, was going to use the money for the Olympics. And the Olympics didn't come here. Thank oh. goodness. So I don't know what the intention They'll find a way to spend it, but I don't know. They haven't played that card yet. I'm a city retiree. I got a small pension from the city, and the mayor says that in this era of high inflation, the city cannot afford to continue to pay a cost of living increase for the retirees. And believe me, we're not getting generous retirements. Uh, how can this be true if he's got a billion dollars in TIF money? Couldn't he just take some of that and pay the, pay the pension plans? The answer is no. Uh, well, the first part of your question is, was underscoring what I was saying, that you can't really have an honest discussion about the city's finances when you have the shadow program siphoning off money. It's not accounted for in any budget. It's not accounted for in the city's budget. It's not even your tax bill. But as the people in Albany Park are learning, people are fighting that library, um, the complexity of the TIF program uh, prevents the city from simply just taking the billion dollars and putting it toward paying off the pension obligation, or taking the billion dollars mm -hmm. and doing a massive rebuilding of the public libraries, for instance, if they wanted to spend a billion dollars. I know it's so far-fetched to imagine something like Ram saying I want to spend a billion dollars on libraries, but there's a uh, sort of procedure that must be followed. Since the money is a diversion from the schools and the parks and the other taxing bodies, if you are to raid some of those reserves, you have to give it back proportionally uh, to the taxing bodies who, at the 
same rate that you took it from them. So roughly 50% of it goes to the school. So if you were going to rate that a billion dollar reserve, right off the bat, 500 million would go to the public schools. So it wouldn't would you be available. you just cost it proportionately against each agency's right. when you, when you pay your pension obligation? Yeah. No, 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 not pension obligation. When you pay a property, how many people have ever seen a property tax bill? We're going to show you one All right, now. Mike Weiner. We're going to do that. Okay. Mike? Oh. Keep answering questions. Okay. Well, the property tax bill, when you get that second installment, which comes in front, what just came a couple weeks ago, it itemizes how much you supposedly, allegedly pay. It's all a lie because it doesn't have the tips in there. But uh, if you take a look at it, you'll see that roughly 51 or 50 percent goes to the Board of Education. So if you pay 1000 at $500 goes to the Board. And I think it's 20% goes to the city and down the line to the libraries and the parks, the county, et cetera. So if the city were to raid the TIF fund, they would have to give back the money, they would have to disperse the money to the taxing bodies uh, at the same rate that they paid in. That's the same percentage they paid in. The schools would get 50, the city would get 20, and the libraries would get six. Um, so that's why you can't just use it for one lump sum private idea like uh, had city pensions. Right. Mike, is there lost the pension No, I'm and sorry. You have had your questions. Okay. It, it seems whenever City Hall announces a new subsidy to attract a business here or keep a business supposedly from leaving the city, uh, that uh, they, they link it with an announcement of uh, TIF money for a particular use, <coughs> and it, it's almost like they want us to think that uh, because well, an employer is paying less taxes than they should be paying, that that somehow results in money that's available for other things, um, and uh, you don't see any clarity in that in the Chicago Tribune coverage, the Sun-Times coverage, the, uh, the local uh, uh, broadcast media. Uh, uh, yeah, why, why, why isn't there clarity in that? And, and also, I was the, I'm in Occupy Chicago, and I was the point person in the, the library thing about undoing the cuts in library services. I was, we, uh, have a, we have a rebuttal period later on. So. Oh, okay. Then the, if you could uh, talk about the, the absence of clarity in the mainstream media on, on what, what yeah, this thing is. I have enough trouble uh, explaining what I do. <laughs> You're now asking me to try to explain what the Chicago Tribune does. <laughs> I read the Chicago Tribune. It's one of my obligations. And uh, I'm usually following at my wife or dog about this unbelievable editorial. And there's, again, there's no relation to reality. So I do not know why the Chicago Tribune and the sometimes cover tips the way they do. I do know that the Tribune is in a very odd position right now. They won't even mention the word. I find this really bizarre. They call, they, instead of saying TIFs, tax increment financing, they'll say the money's coming out of a special economic development fund that's, uh, no, a special taxing district that's supposed to fund economic development. What, are you trying to keep the public stupid? I mean, yes. who even knows what that means, number one? You know, you should be very specific. You should say it comes out of the TIF program, which is a very controversial program, you know, where it's a tax hike in which money is diverted into these funds, which the mayor controls. That's exactly what it is. So I, I don't know the answer to your question, and um, I feel always a little reluctant to try to explain why the Tribune does what it does. Right. Loud, please. This is Sorry? an extension, perhaps, of what Mike uh, just mentioned. Uh, with the sometimes taking home to the reader, the reader has been kind of a hallmark for independent reporting, in depth, going into muckraking as far as tips and other government mess ups are concerned. Do you see a loss of independence with the sometimes taking home to the reader? Uh, that question has been asked to me so many times. Uh, pretty much is asked of me almost every day. I'm usually asking that question of myself. The good answer so far has been no. There's been absolutely no attempt by anyone to get me to alter anything that I do. In fact, um, the day that the Sun Times announced it was buying the reader, they had a little party uh, for us, and I talked to. Uh, 
two different editors who both assured me, we want you to keep doing what you're doing. So I'm taking them at their word, and uh, so far, so good. So. Ivan and then Joyce. Uh, yes, uh, following up on your point, you, you characterized uh, as this budget as some kind of shadow budget. Uh, and, and looking at, I mean, uh, the real estate tax bill that we received, it, it's, it would seem simple enough to include a line how much of this is going to tip. Yeah. Why don't they do it? Um, good question. I, um, uh, I first discovered this. This is one of my great contributions to the city of Chicago and our understanding of it uh, eight years ago. And um, foolishly and very naively, I thought that, and that by publishing the fact that our tax bill lies and uh, tells us that the tips get zero. I can show you it. I brought a tax bill to tip to prove this point. Because sometimes people don't believe me. You can't be telling the truth. I'm like, oh, I swear to God, this is true. Um, so I thought that there would be an outrage and people would demand uh, a change. Of course, absolutely nothing happened. Uh, most people I've discovered don't even look at their property tax bills. And they're bewildered by it. They don't understand it. Just really pay it. So um, why do does this continue? Um, this is my opinion. Uh, I believe that local government does not want you to understand the full extent of the tips impact on your property taxes. They don't want you to understand how much to know how much money is being diverted uh, into these funds, and uh, it would be too problematic for them to continue the program if large groups of people, or even small but vocal groups of people, understood how much money was being diverted. And so what they then do is explain that um, computer technology does not exist to uh, subdivide your tax bill with the TIF, uh, which, seeing my dear friend Merlin here, I absolutely know he's a computer genius. He could figure this out within a day and have it, all right, a week, Merlin, uh, yeah, and have it on your bill. So it's a, it's a totally made-up excuse um, to cover up a program that they don't want you to know about, and um, it has, it will continue, they will continue to, uh, have this subterfuge until somebody uh, files a lawsuit, forces them, I believe, to put this. I don't. It hasn't happened yet, but I have to feel it's some. It's a fraud. It's. I mean, if you viewed it as if a, if a corporation were doing this, uh, get a private corporation, and you, well, you were the shareholders of the corporation, and they were distributing their income statements, and they were saying that uh, 500 million dollars went a year went to our research. Uh, program, which is our equivalent of our education program, when in fact only 250 million was going there, and the 250 million was going to the shadow budget of the CEO, I think the shareholders would sue. So, again, uh, as long as Chicagoans are largely ignorant of how their program, uh, how their city operates, uh, the city is free to do what it wants. You guys good? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm back to the Albany Park Library. Stand up. Oh. Because this is uh, this has been really a real peculiarity to us. I have some questions. First, this library is being funded by fifteen million dollars. That's not a debt. Usually, the tip is a debt. You go into debt, and the way I understand it, please correct me, uh, so that businesses, properties become worth more and the tax is siphoned off for the TIF. But this is not a TIF debt. This is accumulated money from other TIFs in the district. So they accumulated the $15 million. So what I want to ask is, does this make any difference in the approach to either demolishing the library or building a new library? So does this have that effect? That's number one. Number two is, this library, the state law seems to say that you have to have a blight. Your, your project has your to have question. something that's a blight. Okay, I would like to know if this is, this is not a blight, so does this qualify? And the third question is, when is a hearing held when you have a TIF project? 
Wow, there's so many questions here. I can't remember. I can't remember. But don't. I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. I'll start with the last one first. Okay. Um, wow. The Omni Park Library tip fiasco. I, I don't know if I talked to you on the phone. I've talked to several people. Yes, in, I know. Okay, in the area. And it's. I haven't written about it yet. Uh, it could be the topic of a whole discussion. Uh, it is really bizarre. Um, where do I start? Um, there is a TIF district uh, in Albany Park. I forget the name of it. Lawrence it's called Ketsy. Lawrence Kedzie TIF, which was created, I don't know, let's say 15 years ago, I don't remember the exact date, with the intention of following people of, again, pooling tax dollars that would otherwise go to schools and parks, diverting them from schools, parks, county, and library, under our principal, uh, in order to help small businesses and businesses in the area that are struggling because there are some businesses in that area that are struggling there's vacant storefronts it's not unlike hundreds and hundreds of neighborhoods all over the city of chicago all right so that's the principle that's in the abstract lo and behold uh, 15 years later however many years later it is since this tip was created uh, the city out of nowhere uh, comes up with an idea of essentially absorbing all the money that's in reserves, or a good chunk of it, 15, one, five million, to tear down an existing building in which the library is now housed, and then begin construction of a new library which won't be complete in two years. So think about this, people. Again, follow me on this. TIFs are intended to develop properties that, but for that subsidy, would not be developed, and which will then pay more in taxes, thus paying back the money you, the taxpayers, spent to develop that project. Does everybody know that's like the third time I've said this, okay? So what are they doing? They're taking public dollars to tear down a tax-exempt building, a library that pays no taxes, and build a new library that pays no taxes. So you're not paying back the money that you spent. You're not bringing in new money to the tip. It's a complete contradiction of what the program is supposed to do. Now, I'm not arguing against funding libraries. I just believe that the TIF program is not intended to fund libraries. And if you believe that the city has an obligation to fund the new development of libraries, then you should have a line item in your budget for library development. And every year, a certain amount of money will be set aside by the city to pay for the construction or the renovation or the rehabilitation of libraries. That should be an ongoing program. And, th and then you can debate, well, should Albany Park be at the top of the list? Or are there other neighborhoods in the city of Chicago that would need a library before Albany Park? I run the library board, as fanciful a notion as that is, I would say I don't think the best and most prudent expenditure, the limited amount of money we have, is on tearing down an existing library that is pretty good, it's functioning, and putting that community, leaving that community without a library for two years while we build a new one. Instead, whatever modest repairs that library may or may not need would be appropriate use, and then you would spend money building a library in a community that has no library. But for reasons I don't know, I haven't studied it, I presume it has something to do with politics and something to do with the Alderman, just to guess. The city has decided to use money that's intended to improve small businesses uh, along Lawrence and Foster and Kimball and Kedzie and take that money and uh, spend it on a tax-exempt library. So uh, this is just a small but telling example of how this program is completely out of control. Ms. Castle. Thank you. Uh, you almost brushed on it, but I want to be a little more direct. Go ahead. I see yes. real malfeasance here. Yes. I see hypocrisy. I see dishonesty. Yes. Who has the power to put the TIF people literally under the microscope and put them in jail? I don't like criminal behavior, and it should stop. Okay. Well, um... All right, let me just make this point. Again, I'm no lawyer. I don't know criminal behavior. I'm a little reluctant to go that far. Criminal behavior in Chicago generally means someone's getting an envelope uh, in a back room. All right. Um, this is other ways to yeah. This is a corrupt program. Yes. Very corrupt. Uh, I don't know if anybody would be arrested for it. 
Um, I think, if anything, the responsibility, I keep saying this, falls upon the citizenry of Chicago. And uh, I hate to say it, people in Chicago are expecting some sort of knight on a horse to come rescue them from themselves. People, you keep electing. You keep electing. Now, I, uh, it, it's true, in your defense, you elect people who tell you one thing and then completely flip flop. We're now in a ward, 47th ward. I remember when Mayor Pouar was running for office, saying, I am going to clean up the TIF program. All right. Now he's got a TIF over there on a, a Lawrence Avenue for some kind of like uh, shopping center. You know, like, I forget which shopping center it is. The Mayor Pouar, the local one. We are in his ward, so he may come in here and shut us down if I don't speak nicely. <laughs> I voted for him. I am responsible. I, yes, I'm here now, bearing my soul to you. I am guilty. I voted for him. Uh, so it doesn't help that people come into office and completely do the opposite of what they said. All right? So then you have to vote against them. You have to, the mayor came into office. He knew Mayor Ronald Emanuel. We're getting this award. Got to really watch what I say about him. Um, he came in promising to reform because he knew, he knew that. Those three letters, which the Tribune never seems to want to put together, T, I, F, comes to symbolize to average people on the north side of Chicago, at least, people in reader land, if nothing else, something corrupt, some malfeasance, something going wrong. They may not know the particulars, they may not understand how it works, but they know it's bad. So he said, oh yes, I too know it's bad, and I will fix it. Of course he hasn't fixed it. So if the issue matters to you, then you should definitely not vote for him next time around. Uh, I did not vote for him the last time, so you can't hold me responsible for that. So, absence of hiring yourself a lawyer to file suit, which would probably go nowhere because I can't imagine any judge in the <laughs> county would rule against the mayor's favorite money stream. Uh, I'd say move to New York, or uh, I was probably just, I'm probably sure they have their scam there too. I just McHenry don't live there, County, so I don't clean governance. Just okay. throw the bums out, as they say. <laughs> All right, Ayala? Actually, it's, it was my question. Uh, I don't accept this as an answer that uh, people in Chicago are stupid, although it might be true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's no answer, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, not stupid in that way. I, I, I wonder, what about the class actions? So, class actions, I mean, if this is a fraud, I mean, are we really in Sodom and Gomorrah? Do even lawyers are afraid of... I, you know, I, again, I am no lawyer. And a few times I've had discussions with lawyers. Um, they told me uh, that it wouldn't work because there is no injured party. Which I find astounding. I, I mean, I would thought the taxpayers of the city of Chicago are the injured party, but and, and these are informal conversations, probably in this very restaurant. So I'm no lawyer. I've not studied it from a legal aspect. Um, uh, it's the kind of long. It's, a, it's such a long shot quest in this um, judicial environment. County government, and I don't know if many lawyers would want to take it. Um, and I feel it's a little reluctant. I've written about this many times. It's it's kind of pathetic that the citizenry would have to depend on a lawsuit to defend themselves against a program enacted by people that they elect. So again, I I do come back to the people of the city of Chicago. I do come back to them, and I the more and more I've been doing this. The more, the more and more I hold them responsible and accountable for the government they elect. We just got through 20 years of daily. Sorry, gosh, 22. Chopped those first two years off. Couldn't deal with them. It was when they, when Shrafter Harold died, I couldn't deal with it. Um, I don't give them credit for that term, but uh, we just got through with one tyrant, or despot, I should say. And so, right away, we elect another one. <laughs> we got finished at the end. They were, oh, we don't want any more despot. We well, elect another one. So I mean, <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. We elected in five. All right. Well, we're we're gonna, uh, still voted. 
Not you. Do you know what's going on with the Rosenwald building on 47th and Michigan? Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, I saw the headline. I haven't studied that one. That's a, uh, a TIF funded project. I think it's a cottage grow TIF. I can't remember which one. I haven't studied that one. It's one of those to do list stories, so I really don't know much about it. Uh, I'm like, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Can you speak louder, please? Yeah. Can you explain how money is stolen from the schools and, and, and these districts? Because it is my understanding that these districts have levies, and so basically what they do, they will get their budget, they just charge the rest of the people more money on their, from their taxes in order to reach their budget. Yes, that's that's one of the, I've written about this so many times, it's one of the great, uh, I always find it, it's a defense, it's um, uh, a defense thrown out to defend this program. Uh, Carrie Kishley and Alderman, or you know, Ben, uh, you really know that schools are getting their levies. Um, and then we, then we then descend into the netherworld of the Chicago's property tax system, which is like the venture through a cabin. You don't want to go. Um, so, let me explain this. Um, and try to do it as simply as I possibly can without losing the attention of everybody in this room. Um, a levy is essentially the amount of money um, that any taxing body will spend. So a taxing body, let's say the public schools. So the public schools levy in a year, let's just say, keep it $1,000. So they're going to spend $1,000. The way the TIF program that works, following in this people, is that essentially, uh, it means by, it adds like, let's say $200 to that $1,000. So the public schools will essentially be taking from the taxpayers of Chicago $1,200, not $1,000, and that extra $200 will go to the TIFs. And so I'm screaming, what an outrage. When the schools are desperate for money, they're giving away $200 to the TIFs. At which point, our representatives, you are all of them, will come to me and go, Ben, you know, of course, the schools have no, like, no, no reason to complain because they're getting their $1,000 levy. And I'm like, that's your explanation? You're pipping the taxpayers $200 in the name of education, and you're sending it over to the TIFs, and I'm supposed to be happy with that? Okay, because they got their 1000 You told us you're essentially, we're giving them 1200 <laughs> 200's going to the tips, only a thousand's going to education. I'm supposed to be happy with that? That's no explanation. You're essentially saying it's a scam. I mean, you, we're all, and I remember it because whenever that explanation is given to people, they're in a room, they immediately call me. Because there's like, who else are you going to call? It's Tiss. Call Ben. Ben, they just told us that everything you've told us all along is a lie. It's not true because they got their levy. And then I tell them what I told you. And you bought that? <laughs> they took $1,200 from you in the name of education, kept the 1000 and gave 200 to the TIFs, and you think that's a legitimate way to do business? They're skimming off the top. <laughs> if you believe in that, if you believe the only way we can have a pool of money for economic development is to tell the taxpayers we're going to take $1,200 from them, when in fact we're only going to get it for education, when in fact we're only going to take $1,000 from them, skim it to economic development, that's a pretty crummy way to run a system, don't you think? Oh, yeah, I wish I knew that when they were telling me that. So I, I don't buy that as an answer. I believe that if you want to spend money on economic development, you should have a part of the tax bill called the economic development tax so that everybody knows how much money is going into the economic development pool which can then be discussed how we're going to distribute it so that some sections of the city don't get a huge chunk, like the near west side or the near south side, and other sections of the city get virtually nothing, like Roseland, Anglewood, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So that's generally my response. And my attitude is that is no answer. That is merely an explanation of how the scam works. So, anyway. Hey, Jerry Ruiz. Okay. Uh, how much money is, has been given to Walmart and developers that are building Walmart? I do not know the answer to that, and I'll tell you why. I do not know the answer to that. The question was, excuse me, how much money, how much TIF money has been given to Walmart or to developers of Walmart? And I'll tell you why I do not know the answer to that question. 
The reason I do not know the answer to that question is because no direct redevelopment plan has gone to a Walmart. Follow me on this. Every TIF district has money. They, when they spend the money, they approve, the city council approves something called a redevelopment plan, which is a specific plan. So they may say, our redevelopment plan is to build a shopping center at 87th and Cottage Grove. Into that shopping center will go a Walmart. What they don't tell us is what portion of Walmart's rent is lower because that project was subsidized. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? If you, the taxpayers, subsidize the development of a project, that means the landlord of that project is paying less to build it, therefore he can charge his tenants less money in rent. All right. So Walmart probably is the beneficiary of a lower rent because they're moving into a city subsidized deal. But the exact amount, I don't know. I'm not privy to the leases between the tenant, Walmart, and the developer. Uh, Claire. I just repeat uh, again because I think maybe you have the answer to this. Is um, Joyce's question was at what point is the redevelopment plan, you know, approved with a public hearing? You oh, know, because the thing with the Albany Park Library is we think there was no public hearing. There now, was no public hearing for the Albany Park Library. Okay, <clears throat> all right, man, the TIF world. Um, all right. If you have, when a TIF is created, what was that TIF? I forgot the name of it. Lawrence Kensington. Lawrence Kensington TIF. Okay. It's the Lawrence Kensington TIF. It's called the Lawrence Kensington TIF, but the library is neither on Lawrence or Kensington. <laughs> um, and they say this program's easy to understand. All right. When that TIF was created, there was a series of hearings. Now, I can assure you that uh, they did not discuss using the TIF dollars to tear down the existing <laughs> library in the corner of Kimball and Foster when they created the Lawrence Kedzie TIF. So there was a series of hearings, and this is what I alluded to earlier. Um, there's a series of boards, including the city council, the final uh, board, or in this case a council, that has to approve it. And at every step, there's a public hearing. And um, at every stage, there is a board that votes. And in every instance, those boards are complete tools, rubber stamps of the mayor. So there's no, nothing independent about it. And these hearings are, are largely contrived in order to give false impressions of what the program is, how it works, and what it'll do. It's a total sham from start to finish. I've written about this. I actually followed uh, the creation of the LaSalle Central TIF from the time it was uh, first mentioned through all uh, three, I think it's the um, Joint Review Board, the Community Development Commission, and then the City Council. So there were hearings, uh, but again, they didn't talk in specifically about the library. Uh, then, if there's a redevelopment plan, which is what I alluded to earlier, where a contract is signed with, between the City of Chicago and a private company, uh, there's another series of hearings. Uh, one of the, uh, something called the Community Development Commission, one of the City Council. However, if the, t if the city is essentially digging into the TIF reserves and spending it like it's petty cash to build a new library, there are no public hearings. There's, not, there's no redevelopment agreement, so you don't have to have a public hearing. But of course there's no public hearing. If you use the TIF program like petty cash, which is one of my favorite lines, feel free to use it, then you can, you're, there, are, there are no oversight boards. Now there is an alderman right now, Bob Fioretti, who is proposing to make every single expenditure, TIF expenditure, uh, subject to approval by the city council. So in this case, the city, full city council would have to vote on if his, uh, if his proposal passes, which of course it won't. The full city council would have to vote on that um, uh, library expenditure, and then presumably be a hearing at the finance committee. So right now, that's what there was no hearing because they weren't required. Karen, <coughs> yeah, um, you may know about this report to the questions related to the report. The mayor of Milwaukee said the OECD came in the Midwest. I can't hear you. The mayor of Milwaukee said the OECD came in the Midwest and said our government transparency is awful. 
and he's willing to address this, you know, on a regional level, would that be a better way to do it? We, you know, we're being compared to Toronto and it's just abysmal. Our transparency is so problematic. Is that a way to do it? He thinks it might be. He's the, the mayor of Milwaukee, yes. what does he want to do? He, well, he said the OECD report said that in the Midwest, in order for us to develop and not get into these problems with corporations, you know, I guess atomizing us, especially yeah. with the Koch brothers coming into Wisconsin, uh -oh. he would like the region to look at government transparency through the OECD because we've been compared by abysmal ratings compared to okay. Toronto. Would something like that be I, know, I, I never thought about that. Yeah. people because we have higher debt than mortgage people. Well, i got to say, when I first moved to, uh, to Chicago 5,000 years ago in 1981, <laughs> um, I tended, I, I was so new to town and um, I viewed Chicago as under siege by the suburbs, so I, I tend to view Chicago in a fight off the suburbs. Uh, I now watch what's happening. Uh, many suburbs are, have their own TIP programs, right. and so they're like everybody's shelling out money, right. and they're they're being played by one entity against the other. So in the case of Milwaukee, it was they created this abomination called the South Central TIF, somehow or other. The Central Business District was a blighted area and needed money to be. Uh, redeveloped and one of the first things they did was send over money to Miller Coors which is an enormous corporation that makes a lot of beer and money yeah. and and got them to essentially move their offices from Milwaukee to Chicago mm -hmm. and I was like how is this a triumph of anything I mean we're just taking poor Milwaukee you know I mean I actually kind of felt sorry for Milwaukee you know? uh, we did that too there was another another expenditure forget the company one of the first expenditures that there was a company uh, taken from uh, uh, Milwaukee. Uh, similarly, we stole United from Elk Grove Village with TIF money. Uh, Boeing was snatched out of Seattle, uh, not with TIF money, but with a huge uh, subsidy from the state, which, by the way, is a whole other. It's, nobody's watching that, the way the state throws the money around. So maybe uh, we do need some kind of regional approach so that uh, one, the towns aren't killing each other, competing uh, for these businesses. Uh, with Tim you know, it, it's kind of surprising. What's exactly wrong with a TIF in the first place? We've had such a tradition of bribery and skullduggery in Chicago, but yet we see Millennium Park built, we see Metro run on time, we see our roads paved, and I can get from my place in Algonquin to here in about an hour with reasonable traffic congestion. I mean, the city's yeah. working. Yeah, Bribes are an integral part of politics. Yeah. What's wrong with TIFs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm now going to totally change everything I do. And <laughs> it was really, really, really an eloquently articulated there. I didn't see the wrong that way until you just said that. Because you can get from Algonquin to Chicago without like a mental collapse, let's just throw a billion dollars away. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 you see, this, this, this kind of reminds me of thinking, my favorite discussion you can see it now. debate uh, that I had with my fellow Chicagoans, uh, and I try to make you sound like I think they're all idiots. Um, in the uh, the period between 03 and 07, where I would be going on and on about how we have to throw Mayor Daly out, and uh, my fellow Chicagoans would be uh, writing on the reader's website or sending me emails or, you know, oh, move to Detroit. <laughs> what? Why? Why are you picking on Detroit? What? Why would you take a city that has absolutely been de devastated by a loss of it? One central industry is desperately trying to survive and somehow or other say because we are not Detroit, we're better off. So it's okay to bribe people, throw money away, waste money, <laughs> poorly invest people. And by the way, there are lots of sections of Chicago that are every bit as hurting as Detroit. So I, I can never understand that. And then for a while, some people would say, Garrett, they'd say, we're not Garrett, we're not Detroit, we're not Cleveland. I mean, I'm starting to sense a pattern here. We're not Newark. Why are you always comparing us to these cities? Why don't you ever say, we're not Toronto? We're not Minneapolis. Yes. We're not Seattle. We're not New York City. Why are you always picking the poorest communities, the blackest communities, yeah. black political empowerment communities, after you kicked Harold Washington out of power? You know what I'm saying? I just, 
I, I was never comfortable with that. I, that was seemed to be the standard argument advanced by Mayor Daley's strongest North Side supporters yeah. in the period between 03 and 07, by the way, which was a year, four years of unrivaled corruption. I think it, the, the, that four years, 03, were, the feds were, they were knocking on Daley's door. I don't know why they didn't go in, but they were just knocking <laughs> on the door. And, and, and the attitude of Chicago was, was will we have Millennium Park? <laughs> you know, we're not Detroit. We're not Cleveland. I go, no, I mean, we're not Baghdad either. You know, I mean, why don't we just go all out? And, you know, we're not going to All right, Dave Zucker. Yeah, and just a brief thing. Dave Zucker. And your name is not Dave Zucker. But mine is. Sit down there and be quiet. <laughs> Ben, are you a believer in H. L. Mencken's old saying that um, no one ever ever went broke <coughs> underestimating the intelligence of the American people? Was that Barnum? I thought it was Barnum. Mencken. Yeah, I was Mencken. Okay, I thought it was Barnum. Uh, yeah, no, I think he's a wise man. Whoever said it was a wise man. Okay, uh, Charlie. No, I. Oh, you, all right, uh, Joe Mayer. Uh, how and when did the TIF idea take hold and when was it initiated? When all of you were sleeping. Okay, again, the TIF that I described in the abstract, where you use property dollars today to invest in projects that wouldn't be built without the property tax dollars, in the hopes that in the future there are more property tax dollars, that very specific program emerged sometime in the 70s. I want to say it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's I mean it's just such a practical, obvious thing to do. You know, it's, a, it's nothing radical. And the, uh, Harold Washington created the first TIF, and I remember when he created. That's how old I am. And he said that as soon as we're done paying off the loans to to build this project, I'm going to end this TIF because if we continue it, it'll just do the exact opposite of what we intended it to. Instead of giving more money to the schools and the parks who are lending us the money up front, it'll take money from them. Well, of course, sometime in the 90s, that central aspect changed. And since I'm not privy to what was going on in the Daily uh, City Hall, I've often imagined that at some point, some smart person figured out, oh my god, if we just start putting tips all over the city without any ceilings on them, without any accountability, the money will just pour in. Particularly if we have an economic boom and we tip areas on the edge of gentrifying communities that are like really the, the property value is so low, but they're going to go up because of rent on a gentrifying community, and we corral all that new money and nobody's telling us how to spend it. So they probably sat daily down and boss, just stick with me on this because this will really work. And by about the mid-90s, from about 96 to 2003, it was TIF City. And they were creating TIFs all over the place. And that's kind of when I was like, what are these things? Practical politics. And um, so that's when it happened. No one was paying attention. Yes, you have to have a question. I'm sorry. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not from Chicago, but isn't it sort of endemic uh, of how the city works that they have these separate financing districts? Like, for example, doesn't the school, isn't there a separate financing school board thing and nobody's elected and the money is not accounted for? It sort of sounds like another scheme like the TIFs. Sort of, am I wrong on that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, you are right that we don't have an elected school board, uh, but. Uh, Essentially, you're wrong about the other thing. I mean, uh, the, the Board of Education every year goes to the pretenses of writing a budget, and um, if they approve the budget. They have hearings on the budget. They tell, uh, they used to be better than they are now. Uh, their current online budget, I don't want to go on this tangent, is, is an abomination. But anyway, uh, they'll tell you specifically how they're going to spend the money. So uh, there is relative honesty, I hate to use that word anyway with Chicago, uh, when it comes to the school's budget, and the city's budget's the same way. If you want to know how the city department, Chicago's Department of Streets and Sanitation is spending its money, you can go online and look at the city budget. What you don't know 
is what portion of that budget has been diverted to the TIFs. What you don't know is what portion of your tax dollars has been diverted to the TIF. So essentially, uh, we do have uh, the pretense of honest, quote unquote, budgeting with all these, these departments are very open and transparent about how they're spending their money. Sorry. Uh, in the case of the schools, etc., but the TIF is completely in the shadow, so it's sort of even worse than you're imagined. Uh, so you're saying it's part of the same budget, it's not a separate, I thought it was a totally separate The TIFs are completely separate. Thing. No, no, the educational. Oh, the Board of Education is in and of itself, it's completely separate, but if you want to look at the Board of Education budget, mm -hmm. you just go to the Chicago Public School okay, website, okay. they've got like 11 years of budgets. Okay. There's nothing, you can't find that for the TIF. You can't find all, any years budgeting of TIFs. You can't, if you try to find out how much the city spent in TIF funding, what you, you end up, you go to the city's website where they've essentially taken every single TIF document and dumped it. All right, Ben, you want transparency? Here, we're just going to throw it all out there. Good luck. You know, and I'm calling Merlin. How do I get this stuff? How do I access it? Can I get this on an Excel sheet? You know, so, um, no, it's, okay. yes, yes, the Board of Education is a separate entity, but they have their own rules that they are required to play by. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's my understanding that one of the functions of the TIF when it's installed is to cap the uh, spending levels of the public services alive within the district. So that school, that public park, that uh, sewer system or whatever uh, is capped for 20 some years. Have you thought about how it plays into creating the budget shortfalls, the crises, and the degradation of the public sure. infrastructure that then leads to the claim that uh, we've got to privatize this. Okay. Um, <coughs> which, 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 what happens? The problem with the TIF program, it's a <coughs> convoluted system. Uh, it's like a Rube Goldberg scheme. Is anybody yeah. old enough to know yeah. Rube Goldberg scheme? Yeah. Scheme, I yeah. understand. All right. it's, it's, so it's Rube. we were, <laughs> the question I answered over here about levies sort of answers the question that you were asking. Um, when a TIF is created, it does not repeat, does not, quote unquote, cap the amount of spending that the schools in a TIF area get. All right? So now we, we, I think we are literally in a TIF. Right now, this restaurant is a, this blighted section of Lincoln Avenue. It's actually a tip. Um, so it, it's like the schools around here get their money. The people around here get their garbage collected. But essentially, the schools as a whole, as I said earlier, have to divert a portion of the money that they take in to the TIF accounts. That's the cap sort of principle that you're talking about. So, I mean, I could explain it. I don't know how many people actually want to hear an explanation of how a TIF works. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I'm going to look uh, at Margaret. If she looks bored with this explanation, I'm going to stop it. So you better look really attentive. The capping that occurs is what they do is they take, it's a, it's a literal map, so they take a map and they say, well first of all, we've got to back up. You have to know how your property taxes work to understand this, all right? So, basic 101, I've done this in classrooms of 10th graders and they understand it. So I expect all of you to be as good as they are. <laughs> What you do is you take the value of your property and you multiply it by the tax rate. So if your property is worth $100 and the tax rate is 10%, Margaret, how much do you pay? Dang, oh, very good. You're smarter than 10th grader. Okay, that's what you pay. So when they come in and they create a tip, the cap is on that property tax that they can tax. So if Margaret's property is worth $100 when the tip is created, as far as the schools, and the county and the uh, libraries, etc., it's still only worth $100. So if the tax rate goes uh, 
up to, well, let's do it this way. If her property value goes from $100 to $200 and the tax rate stays at 10%, how much she pay? 20 That extra $10 does not go to the schools, the park, and the county. It goes to the TIF. You follow what I'm saying? So that's the cap that you're referring to. Did I... Yeah, confuse yeah, everybody. Well See, that's why I don't like going down in the netherworld of TIFs. They want you to go to go down in the netherworld of TIFs so they can get you so perplexed. And said, it's like, all right, let's take it one further. If you can't tax her property at its full value, you have to raise the rates accordingly to bring in the levies. This is the part they really don't want you to catch on. In other words, Schools can't tax the full $200 because only 100 of it is taxable. So to compensate for the money they can't get out of her property because it's in a TIF, they raise everybody's rates. That's why I always tell people, the one thing you need to know about TIFs is they're a tax hike. And that's why they love me when I came in this restaurant with those libertarians and free market people. I was like, you guys are paying more in taxes because of the tips. And they were like, yeah, man, yeah. And then, of course, they deserted me like everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, push come to shove. Where are you guys? So anyway. You mentioned earlier you had a tax bill that could show where the tip money was going. No, I, I, I have a tax bill. I will show you that it says zero. I don't know where it's going. Is there no way to do the, t the tip? Or tip? And you can't look at it, you mentioned your computer friend, and break out what the real TIF Yes, you is. can. And is that information public? That information public, thanks to David Orr. Okay. Squeeze him a little bit, you got him to do it. Um, this is so bizarre. This is what is so bizarre about our system. Well, there's so many things bizarre about our system. The public document that they give you is completely erroneous and misleading and a lie. But if you take your PIN number, does everybody know what a PIN number is? Yeah. Yeah. If you own property, you know what a PIN number is. That's your personal ID, your property ID number. So if you take that PIN number, your property ID number, and you go to David Orr's website, and you find it, you have to search around, but you can find it, and you type that in, it will tell you how your property tax bill is really being distributed. So your property tax bill that you get, the thing that you think is an official, actual statement, that's true, must be true, it's coming from the county, so, and you're paying it, okay? and, you know, it's like, they say you got to pay it, but they're going to take your property away. They tell you X, Y, Z, but then you go to David Orr's site, and you go, oh my God, 62% of this is going to the TIF, and only 38% is going to the tax bodies. So they tell me I'm paying $500 to the public schools, and in reality, I'm only paying 200 or whatever. So, yes, you can find that if you go to David Orr's website. And God bless David Orr for putting that on his website. But uh, I don't know why, if we can put it on David Orr's website, we can't just put it on the property tax bill to begin with. <laughs> and by the way, that only deals with people who actually live in a TIF. What it doesn't account for is someone like me. I don't live in a TIF, and yet my property tax bill is affected by the TIFs. Yeah. My rate is higher because of the TIFs. So how much of what I pay goes to the TIFs? Ooh, no, that's it's like beyond a mystery. Okay, Mike, thank you. Yeah, what can be done to fix the place and how, how, uh, how, that, how we go about fixing it? Well, uh, I was what I was, when the question was answered there, and it was not a very popular answer, so I'm trying to find a new one. <laughs> Can't think of a new one. The only way you can change our crazy system is to force the people who run it to change their behavior. You have to oh, hold really? them. There has to be a consequence for malicious, lying, corrupt process. Politics. There has to be. You, this is what I used to tell the people who would I'd have these bizarre conversations with people who would tell me they love the articles I wrote, they couldn't stand the way daily ran government, but they were gonna vote for them anyway. I'm like, well, why would he ever change if there's no consequence to his behavior? If he's not going to be held accountable for what he does, what motive does he have to change? Same thing with Ron. He's free to do whatever he wants. The only one who's ever stood up to Ron Emanuel is one year is Carol Lewis and the Chicago Teacher Union. It's the only person. Everybody else is cowering and hiding. And she gets whacked around. Oh, she should be nicer. Oh, she should be you know, nicer to the mayor. Do what he wants and stuff. Why? 
<laughs> why? <laughs> and who, why? That hasn't worked for anybody else, but you know. Oh, he's, he's a bully, so I'll just coward him and let him do what he wants. So anyway, my answer to you is what my answer was before. You just have to hold people accountable. You go to a public forum and alderman, you ask them about tips. It's so funny, and it's true, because they'll just lie. After, in 07, after that, or 08, at a cockamamie parking meter disaster, <laughs> I heard one automated candidate and another all the way from Rogers Park down to the south side swear up and down that either if they were in there, they wouldn't have done it, or if they had to do it again, they wouldn't do it. And so they turn right around with that infrastructure trust, and what's the first thing they do? They all do it. So you should vote them all out. Every single person who voted for that infrastructure, go. I mean, he said he wasn't going to do it, but he did it. He wouldn't want to get it. So, anyway. So, when? Well, you wrote uh, about a month ago that uh, the new alderman of this ward, the mayor payer, was only uh, pretending dependent. Do you have anything more to say about that? Well, I already, I actually, actually already said something about that already, but uh, <laughs> yeah, he flip flopped faster than any politician I've ever seen, so. <laughs> Quite a remarkable uh, move. He, he, he campaigned as a, uh, a reformer uh, who opposed the whole TIP program, uh, opposed the parking meter uh, sale, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, it was going to vigorously uh, examine city budget. Uh, and boy, I mean, he just fell in line. In his defense, uh, he, his, he is. Ron Mayo is his ward, and Ron Mayo is a very willful and determined guy. So it's it's one thing for me to stand up here and say, "Don't vote the way the mayor is telling you to vote." And I guess it's another thing to have to face the mayor yelling at you, <laughs> saying nasty things about your mom. The mayor would not last very long in a college complex. He's always <laughs> saying nasty things about people's mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Can you park? Yes. Uh, which leads to the, the question. Chips uh, are not unique to Illinois. Do all the states have these? And my first question. And the second question is, is the percentage of total property tax averaged throughout the entirety of Chicago? Uh, those people came within the districts and those people that are not. The entire area. What percentage? I don't know the answer to that question, uh, the second question about the TIFs, because uh, it's a very complicated formula. Uh, then you get into this almost like, uh, God, uh, existential question, which I've heard every single defense of TIFs. So guys, I, I've been doing this for so long. But follow me on this one. Then you can't really determine how much money TIFs take from, or how much actually you pay in because of the TIFs, because the TIFs have cre increased the value of property. Mm -hmm. So, like, a TIF-funded development has increased the value of that lot, therefore, your property may be more valuable because of the TIF, so therefore, your, that TIF uh, is more, is working, if you follow what I'm saying. I, I find that a preposterous argument. There's so many examples of TIFs that haven't worked, uh, that have just left, the, the, the development's incomplete, so it's an empty lot instead of a developed lot. Like, well, the Albany Park Library well, was never paying TIF dollars, but it was never paying tax dollars. So there's no way to answer that question. In terms of other cities, um, the, the, the concept of a TIF, uh, like I said, in the abstract is used throughout the world. I get calls from all, like England, Scotland, Australia, that you were, we just are implementing a TIF program here, and I've read your stuff on the internet, and what, you know, how's it working in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do as we do. So, uh, but no, as far as I know, no um, city has uh, <laughs> made, uh, turned it into this shadow budget like Chicago. And I do know there's a huge TIF crisis of sorts, and I won't go into this because it's way too, uh, much of a tangent in California. They don't call it the TIF program, but um, essentially uh, Jerry Brown, the governor of California, abolished them. And now there's a huge crisis that they have to try to figure out how to pay off the obligations 
the outstanding monthly bonds that they had uh, because um, it's essentially abolished the TIF program. It wasn't called the TIF program. That's, I forget what they called it. Okay. Jeff Schrammack? Yes, sir. Earlier in your talk, you referred to roughly a billion bucks laying around potentially for a rainy day fund. Right? Now, can you imagine, or what are the odds that you would say that the point of this is indeed for a rainy day? How plausible do you see it that this mayor and his cronies see what certain other folks like in the peak oil community see coming down the road? In other words, it, you know, that there would be an actual, that there's going to be an outright emergency and they're hogging this money for an outright emergency. How plausible do you regard that theory as being? Well, um, for a collapse of tax revenues. I, 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 I wrote this article years ago, uh, tongue in cheek, that uh, this was the piggy bank uh, that they were setting aside for rainy day. I don't think anybody else set it aside. I, I think the full intention is to spend it on something that we don't need. Um, so, uh, but I think if a lot of pressure is put on Ron Emanuel, uh, for instance, he wants to do a longer day, which means he has to hire more employees, whether the teachers or not. He has to, um, uh, you know, expand the arts <coughs> education program. Add recess, so he's got to he's got to get money over to the schools. Suddenly, there's pressure on him. You know, maybe I better raid the TIF funds to do that. But again, it's only a proportional thing. So once you start, if you take money out to give the schools, then you have to apportion the rest of the money to take out to the other taxing board. So you have to give some to the county. He's like, he doesn't want to give that money to the county. It's his money. Okay, that's why that's that's like, why should he give it back? They were dumb enough to let him take it in the first place. It's not his problem. So I think that he would be really reluctant to do that because it's a control issue. If you have a billion dollars, and again, I don't know if it's a billion. I've been throwing that number around. I can't remember what it is, but let's say it's a billion. Let's say it's 700 million. If you have all that money sitting in a bank and you give it away, it's like, no, I think I might want to use that because, I don't know, uh, maybe I want the Olympics. 2020, or well, you know, want NATO, another NATO summit that worked so well. Yeah, right. Right. Well, that's how we did it. Uh, let's bring G8 to town. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think it's too much power for him to give up. Too much control for him to give up. Uh, that's my opinion. Okay, this lady here. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Your Emily. Name. Emily, thank you. Um. Maybe this is too technical, but I thought that when a TIF district is created, the, the money that comes from that levy is supposed to go back to that district. Yes. Isn't there a rule yes. about that? Well, yes, there's, I'm looking yes. for a yes. legal. Yes. Um, okay. That is one of the major flaws, in my humble opinion, with the TIF program. Uh, the TIF program, uh, it, it was sold as the neighborhood's little piggy bank, so to speak. So if the money, if the tip, the money is by law supposed to be spent in that district, now you can do something called porting, which is another little loophole in the law that says you can move uh, money from one tip, yeah. tip district to another, or you can even take money from a tip district and spend it in an area that doesn't have a tip uh, if it's for a municipal project which is how Mayor Daly got to spend money on for Millennium Park, even though it's not in a TIF. Oh. Took money from the Central Loop TIF, was in, which was intended to speak, <laughs> spark economic development in the Loop, the downtown center. He spent it to build a park uh, uh, on the east side of Michigan Avenue. So, um, so yes, we're supposed to spend it in that area. The problem is, what's unfair about it, as I was saying, if you create a TIF, remember, the TIF caps the amount of property that the Board of Ed and the Park District can tax. So the greater the growth of the property in that area, the more money goes into the TIF. So to use our example, if Margaret's property is taxed, is capped at 100 and it goes up to value of 1,000, then um, that's a lot of money for her TIF district to have to spend. So if you're in, if you create TIFs everywhere in Chicago, if you allow TIFs to be created in poor neighborhoods, 
and rich neighborhoods, and the rich neighborhoods obviously have an advantage because they have a higher tax. They have more property to tax. So that's a flaw. That's why I say, you know, if you want to have an economic development program, then you should have a real economic development program, in which is then we decide how are we going to distribute the money, as opposed to what we have now, which is a program that benefits a handful of neighborhoods tremendously and does very little for the rest of the city. Okay. Uh, yes, young man, I'm sorry I don't know you yet. Uh, uh, my name's Tom. Um, how do you see the, the TIFs and their infrastructure trust, like, working out? Because they're kind of, like, different, but it seems like if you have, like, this slush fund yeah. for these TIFs and this other option for an infrastructure trust, you can sort of, like, bifurcate. <laughs> or, you know, just, like, you take... You know, it's like you can you can still seem like you're developing some neighborhoods, but some neighborhoods you're obviously doing more because you have like, like ready capital. You don't have to go to a third party for it. Well, I, I would I would look at them as different things. And my advice to anybody trying to figure out uh, the infrastructure trust, it, it's related to TIFs in that it's um, sort of a scam, more of a sham. <laughs> And so you should think of it as that. But there are two com different things. The infrastructure trust is more like a parking meter deal, in which the city of Chicago is essentially telling its citizenry that we have figured out a way to pay for things that cost money, like building buildings, in a way that won't cost you money. And uh, so, you know, good people. Um, so what they're going to do, well, we, we don't really know what they're going to do because they haven't come out with a specific proposal, but essentially what they're going to do is take money up front from investors to, and then use that money to build something and then pay back the investors by giving them um, a portion of money that would otherwise go to the city for services and stuff. So they say, well, we're not raising your property taxes. We're just going to give them the money that would ordinarily go, well, like, let's say they're going to rebuild the, the, the use the infrastructure trust. They threw this idea out there uh, to uh, extend the red line from 95th Street to the city limits, which is a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right. So what they propose, what do you know what we'll do? We will charge people more money to ride right. from 95th to the end of the line, or from the end of the line to the loop, than we would ordinarily charge. And that extra money would go to the people who put the money in to let us rebuild. Well, we're still paying for it. We're paying for it with money that would ordinarily go to subsidize uh, the CTA, or more to the point, we're paying for it by paying more for a service that we get now for less. But they want you to think that you're not paying for it. So in that way, I'd say the trust is essentially a sham, where they're trying to get us to believe that they're giving us something for nothing, but of course we're paying for it. In that way, it's like the tips, where they try to tell us that it's not a property tax, when of course it is a property tax, if you follow what I'm saying. Folks, I'm really on fumes right here. I know I, you think I could talk about tips forever, but uh, at some point I'm going to have to... Let's, let's go I to think Dennis Murphy had a question. Dennis? No. Don't ask me to explain property taxes, please. Brom, we've got to go to rebuttal soon. How many, just how many tips are there in the city? Are they still being created, or is there still a possibility of them being created? And is it possible to do away with a particular tip? Uh, yes, it is possible. You can do away, they have done away with tips, uh, which weren't functioning very well, and so they got rid of them. Um, they have TIFs are in existence for 24 years, and then they go extinct uh, unless the city decides, uh, with the help of the General Assembly, requires their assistance. You can add another 12 years to it. I believe there's approximately mm, 160 TIF districts in Chicago. And the good news is that um, because of all the bad attention that uh, the, note, the, the TIFs have sort of been, uh, developed over the years, or uh, uh, the notion in people's mind that there's something bad about TIF, 
they're a little reluctant to create new ones. And I don't believe they've created a new TIF district under Rom. I don't believe he has created a new TIF. And I think even Mayor Daly had, didn't create one in the last year. So they've really slowed down. And by the way, they're in big troubles, and it's a whole other issue, because of the property taxes, uh, the real estate bust, they're bringing in less money than they had. Okay. Yes, uh, Charles? Yeah, Ben, I'm looking to build a, a railroad from Chicago to New York, high speed. <laughs> We're going to need a couple stations and a lot of dedicated railroad track. And do you think it's an appropriate use of tip money to put men to work on my railroad? Well, here's my attitude about that question, which I get all the time, not with that specific. Uh, it's generally phrased this way. Well, Mr. Gloomandu, can't you think of one tip that you like? You know, like, yeah. throw some negative. Thank God. And, um, uh, I want to be a real good guy. Come on, say something good about the mayor. Um, so, my attitude about it is this. We live in the real world, I understand. So, if we take a program uh, that's intended to increase property tax taxes, uh, in blighted communities that, but for that development, uh, would have no development at all. And we use that to do something great, like build a railroad. Well, you know, Ben, I guess I'd say, you know, I guess I'm not going to worry about the means. I'm just going to worry about the end. Uh, so where do we stop with that one? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I hate to, uh, how long do I just keep looking the other way while we do all these scams? That's what people, like, one of the defense I used to get from the city, all the time when they talk to me, there were some people in the daily years that would talk to me now, nobody talks to me, so <laughs> people. Um, was that, well, you know what, Ben, you got to be realistic. And uh, this is how our city works, and this is the oil that greases it, and, uh, you know, you got to learn to play the game, and we're learning to play the game. And so, yeah, it's a little deceitful, it's a little tricky, and it's a sham, and it's a scam, and yeah, everything you say is true, but we just built the library. People like libraries. You just built a school. People like schools. So what are you worried about? Get off your high horse. You come here and do it. So how many trees have you planted? How many schools have you built? You know, right? How many railroads have you built? So you know, I'm, I'm not completely immune to the logic embedded in that notion that this is how you do things. This is why Chicago is not Detroit. You know, which is, of course, a ludicrous statement, uh, because we're dishonest. It's the only reason we're not Detroit. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I would like to think that there would be a more honest, transparent, apparent, straightforward way of building your railroad without uh, trickery, deceit, lying, and what have you. But uh, maybe I'm wrong. All right. Uh, Let's go to my book. What is it? Yeah. Thanks for the very well Yes. Yeah. Um, well, we would like to hear your question. Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, we're talking about the west side. Yeah. Loud place. The United Center area. Uh, the United Center area. Is, I, well, the, the United question. Center was, was well, subsidized. Was question? Oh, the question was, he asked me about the west side. Uh, is there a TIF in the, is the United Center in a TIF? I believe that was your question. The United Center is not in a TIF. The United Center was um, largely subsidized by an enormous property tax break that Reinsdorf and Wirtz got uh, in the early 90s from uh, the General Assembly. So that's what subsidized the construction, and the, it's an ongoing tax break. Oh, uh, Lord. So anyway, uh, but, uh, no, that's a whole other way of, well, Let's take one more and go to rebuttals. Go to rebuttals. Over there. Let's see. Uh, Gary, did you have a question no. earlier? There's a guy no. over there. Right. Right. There's a guy over there. Hi. Is the CME in a TIF? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, the, the Chicago, he asked, is Chicago Mercantile Exchange in a TIF? Um, 
okay, yes, and uh, at one point, Mayor Daly was like begging them to take TIF dollars. Please, take this money. Uh, I wrote about that a lot. So what, what, if they're in a TIF, how come they still also got a break from the, from the governor? Okay, well, uh, let's let's take that. What, why did they get the break from the developer? Because they asked him and gave it to him. Oh, sorry. The state of Illinois. Yeah, they only gave him one because they asked for it. Uh, they didn't have to prove anything or establish anything. It is true. Well, what in, 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 okay, this is one of the great, I guess, ironies of all time. Mayor Daly was so desperate to give them TIF TIF money, I forget how much it was, I get my TIF dollars mixed up, it may have been 15 million. Uh, but if they were to take that money, they would have to agree to stay in the city of Chicago. So rather than, uh, if they were going to take that money and agree to stay in the city of Chicago, they then couldn't threaten the state of Illinois uh, that they were going to leave if they didn't get a tax break worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So they essentially traded the TIF gift of 15 million, along with its stipulation that they stayed in the city of Chicago, uh, for uh, a tax break uh, worth much, much more money. It was a great move on their part. I give them all the credit in the world. Very bad move on the part of uh, our governor, our mayor, our state senate president, our speaker of the house. <laughs> And everybody else who ostensibly represents us. Let's go to rebuttals. Uh, let's go to Sorry, rebuttals. Come on, Brown. Brown, we got to go to rebuttals. be about the right four minutes is about the max four minutes at most four minutes at most Brom four minutes all right let's rock and roll thanks let's thank our speaker again one more time please Whether we want to admit it or not, 
And uh, so the way that we will have to work at some of these solutions will be with less available energy. Now, the other thing that we have to take into consideration that if we find uh, abundant, clean, and inexhaustible amount of energy on some form, that that will not change the bind that we find ourselves in. Imagine that tomorrow or next year we find an, a very, very good source of energy that is totally clean, is totally inexhaustible, and uh, we implement that. So we have the ability to continue driving, to continue having air conditionings, and so on. Will that energy will reduce the amount of poor people in the world? Will be more schools be built because of we found that, that source of energy? Uh, will we have a better management for the waters of the world, or we will not use the genetically modifying seeds on all over the world to be in control of Monsanto or something else? So think about that. The solution is not finding more energy. The solution is in changing the way we are managing the world. And that is a very difficult thing to imagine. What Ben told us today, it was that it's very difficult to understand how the city is being managed and how it's not transparent. But imagine understanding, imagine what uh, will take to, uh, what kind of an understanding will take to change the way that we work, the things we manufacture. People are demanding a job to make what? Plastic shit? <laughs> but that's what people are demanding. I want a job. I don't care what I do. And uh, this is not going to solve anything. It's continue the same road to, 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 to diminishing the environment that we live in. So that's all my, my thought for today. How many minutes do I have? Two? Four. Four minutes. Has, has Ben left already? He's making a phone call, sir. Okay. Um, well, I, I was hoping he'd be here, but I just want to point out that the reason I asked about the uh, CME is because in addition to the TIF subsidy and the subsidy that they kind of try to extort from the state, they're also getting another subsidy, and that is they have hundreds of foreign workers on uh, guest worker visas underpaid that would be paying the mar real market wages to American citizens. So they're really triple dipping, or maybe at least double dipping. So I wanted Governor Quinn to tell the CME, open up your books before we give you the subsidy, and tell us how much money you're already saving with these guest worker visa programs, and we'll just subtract that from this uh, gift we've given to you. And nobody ever thought to do that. That's outrageous. You know, it all comes down to who's going to do the work and how much are they going to get paid. That's, that's our economy. Who's doing the work? How much are they going to get paid? And who's, who's controlling the money to pay? Well, what I'm seeing in, in this state of Illinois is that we're giving a subsidy of cheap labor on these guest worker visas of about three quarters of a billion dollars a year. You go down to the state farm, there's a, a thousand people from foreign countries, mostly from India, working down there with visas. So when we, when we think about TIPS, we have to look at it in the, in the bigger picture of subsidies. Subsidies that are unfair, that put the burden on the rest of us, the people that already don't need that CME doesn't need a subsidy. This was just extortion. So I want you to think about that. And um, that's all I have to say. If you have any questions about global labor arbitrage and how they're displacing American citizens with these guest worker visa programs in our country, uh, feel free to ask me. And one last point, even at this high level of unemployment, we're allowing over a million foreign legal workers every year into the country. This is an outrage, and it makes a mockery of what it means to be an American citizen living and working in our own country. Thank you very much. TIFs are an unusual situation, and I thank uh, Brother Jurafsky for explaining them to us. 
Uh, he mentioned the, the red line, which is one of my favorite uh, subjects. It runs from Howard Street all the way down to 95th Street on the south side. Uh, there's, there have been plans to extend it. In fact, in the 1960s and 70s, when the U.S. Department of Transportation, the state of Illinois, and the city considered putting the uh, red line down the middle of uh, the Dan Ryan Expressway, they intended it uh, to go in two directions. One to follow I-57 all the way to 147th Street, and the other on the east side all the way out to 159th Street. Mm -hmm. The trains would split. Um, there's, the median strip is already, is already planned for, it's there, and all they have to do is lay the track there and put up the stations. However, now, through the TIF, they have come to this marvelous solution to stone two kills with one bird, as they say. Um, they want to extend the red line by tearing down all the homes along State Street and adjoining blocks, uh, th through, through the Roseland community and out to the city limits and perhaps beyond out to Pietong, who knows. But uh, they're willing to, to tear down the homes of the, of the, the people, uh, predominantly a black or uh, poor white community, in order to do that. Instead of using the already constructed median strips, medium vacant to go all the way out to 147th Street and 159th Street, uh, TIFs will do that eventually unless we do something about it. I'm Michael Foley. I just want to say thank you to Mr. Jurofsky for being here and for talking to us. And I also want to thank him for writing about this in the Chicago Reader newspaper all these years. I also want to thank the Chicago Reader newspaper for the fact that it exists. I don't know when I started reading it. I've probably been reading it somewhere around the beginning. I've been reading it for most of the time it's been out. I'm not saying I read it every single week, but the Chicago Reader has been part of my life for a long, long time, and I'm very happy that it's here. They have been, over the years, they have always been writing about stuff that none of the other papers or media outlets will even talk about. Anyway, I just want to thank, again, the Chicago Reader newspaper and all the people working for it and writing for it. Thank you. Well, thanks for a great talk. I, uh, I'll try to personalize this. Uh, it's the story of the three H's. Uh, I actually live in Hollywood House. It was partly financed by a TIF. That's why I'm telling this story. Hollywood House started out uh, at least some years ago. Uh, it was owned by the second H, uh, Hellenic Foundation which is a, uh, a foundation for, you can tell by the name, uh, Greek people. Uh, they try to help Greek people, poor Greek, Greek old people, get a nice place to live. Problem developed, the Greeks got rich. They moved out. Uh, there were some Greeks left, but uh, the Hellen Hellenic Foundation realized, gee, only one third of the people here are now Greek Orthodox. And they also had trouble uh, keeping the building up. So some of the building fell into disrepair. What do you do? Well, you sell it to somebody else. And that was Heartland Housing. Heartland Housing bought the building from the Hellenic Foundation. But they needed money to finance this, to buy the building and to uh, repair the building because there were some issues to repair. They went in and got TIF funding. I know this personally because I went to the 48th Ward uh, Zoning and Planning Board with other people and gave a song and dance as to why this building needed the money. Uh, also had to go to a civil, uh, 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 the uh, Chicago uh, uh, Council Committee and the Chicago uh, Council to talk about this. Anyway, we got the, the uh, TIF funding. The, uh, help, so, uh, the Heartland Housing owns the building. They rehabilitated the building. Uh, and I've got, now I've got a very nice apartment. So I guess I benefited from the, uh, from the uh, TIF funding. There's really a question in my mind now that 
that whether this was a good idea because I don't see much more money coming in on this deal. There, it is true that the building is full of generally uh, people that are poorer than I am. There's only 10% market rate. A lot of the people that are in the building are poor church mice. They're really poor. Uh, so in that sense, it's it's good. But is there more money coming in because of this tip? I say no. But it's a, a interesting story. I lived through it, and as I said, I benefited from it. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't expect to get any good news tonight, but possibly we got some good news of a sort. If Ben is anywhere near correct, that this administration is sitting on something approaching a billion bucks. A crucial question for our time here is, will they come up with a way of blowing that money for <laughs> this city and the rest of the country? is rocked by the mother of all crises. It's an open question as to whether that crisis will be produced by peak credit, peak oil, or maybe even peak decent climate. Although, I'll put that one last in terms of likelihood, as I understand it. But Frank and I get together every now and then, and who knows, I can imagine Frank could give you a speech on the odds of peak oil versus peak stable climate, but be that as it may. If these guys don't manage to piss that money away, even if they didn't intend to build this fund for that purpose, nonetheless, it's not too hard to imagine that they might actually, by their lights, bite the bullet and use that billion bucks to save the city, whereas other cities around, and maybe across the whole country, might be going down the drain without that backup to resort to. So, given that the system we are living in is a joke, and various folks have told various stories here, including a bit about the, uh, the, the workers being brought in from overseas, there's, there's a, just a whole bunch of things going on which are all but sabotage in terms of their consequences for the United States. Given that the, that the system, the whole system, county level, state level, city level, federal level, it doesn't matter, they spend money like water, like it grows on trees on the presumption that the tax revenues will just keep on rolling as they always have, or supposedly always have. Well, within a couple of years, give or take, my prediction is that uh, that illusion will come to an end. And they're going to be desperate as hell. And uh, we here, as fate would have it evidently, um, are, are actually going to have a better chance of getting through the zoo that's coming down the road than evidently any other city in the country, unless there's a few other mayors or whatever around the country that also have pulled off similar things to get Ben is here. I'd like that would have been my follow-up for him. But, you know, the system is what it is, and the American people are going to have to at some point to start facing what it is, regardless of uh, whether the media gives a damn enough to tell us about what it is. Frank alluded to certain aspects of the course that we're on. And I sure don't see any indication that anybody with any power in the media has any intention whatsoever as to uh, wake up the American people, even though just in these past four years, the American people, if not the world, have had no fewer than one wake-up call on average per year um, telling us that the party is in the process of coming to an end, and it's just a question of which peak ends up getting us first. And it was striking tonight when Ben was asked about why doesn't the trip, among others, um, you know, dig into any of this, answer any of the kind of questions that arise, and he really didn't know what to say about it. Well, um, I've got a theory of sorts, and that is that the media has in particular become so corrupted in the first instance by the technology of mass communication, namely TV and radio, and the mentality that has grown up within those institutions has evidently sort of oozed down the hill into the other media institutions also. 
And so what, uh, at least there are certain circles in this country who pay attention to this and <coughs> refer to PAC journalism. And in the case of the national media, the media in Washington, D.C., there are those who refer to that place as Versailles on the Potomac, <laughs> which is, for those of you who don't know, a reference to um, France uh, a good 200 plus years ago before Louis and his wife lost their heads. As two ways to distribute money to the one that you wanted to go to. It's the legal way, it's the illegal way. Now, I don't know, somebody, uh, Jeff just said that the newspaper should wake up the public. Give me a break, please. <laughs> the Iraq war was a joke. And a major paper, including so-called liberal paper like the New York Times, went along with the big uh, 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 official version that we had a right to be over there. And all of them backed the president on going to war. So take my word for it. The people that want the, want the money, going to get the money. There's two ways they get it. One is, for instance, uh, they had the ex aldermans or whoever it was in the picture of the paper, they had three or four days, they locked them up for, for, for corruption. Now, everybody around here, if they had $20 for so every politician was locked up for corruption, they would go and get a new car because they would have that much money. Now, the other way that they uh, uh, get this money, our money, is legally. Now, if you remember when George W. Bush came in, you had people that say, oh, let's have them put their money in the stock market. They'll make more money by going to the stock market. And believe it or not, some people believe that was true. Because you had people saying things like, oh, the stock market always go up over time. Give me a break, please. Those people wanted your know, social security money for the same reason. I'll get to that later. But the social security money is good money. And you're going to give it to these people on Wall Street, and they're going to expand this by taking that uh, base and making trillions out of nothing. And when the social security failed, they gonna do just what they did when they got a hold to the house. Did you want to okay? They gonna get that good money, stash it in warehouses all over the world, yeah. and then they gonna go to the government and say, give me some more money. So, we talking about TIF tonight, people, but the guy that get our money, and the people that get our money, just not talking about TIF, let's talk about everything all over the world, and you can bet, that 95, 6, 7 percent is legal. Because the tip is legal, ain't nobody in jail, right? 95 percent of it is legal. Why? Because they done went and bought your alderman. They done went and bought your congressman. They done bought your senator. They done corrupt everything out there. They own us. So quit tapping your hand and talking about the vote. The vote don't mean shit. I did. I had a good night. Clear the way. All right. Well, too bad Ben's not here. I wanted to, to, to thank him. Uh, I, I like to see him every couple of years, so it refreshes my memory of how these how these tips work. So for uh, two more years, I'll I'll forget. It's so confusing and messy. Yeah, everything. I live in Indiana. Yeah. We don't have such things. We if there was if they tried doing something like this in Indiana. Losing the election would be the least of their problems. These guys would probably be hanging from a tree or shot. Uh, <clears throat> but Indiana this year, we have a budget surplus, and we're all going to get like $100 back from, from taxes. And then next door here in Illinois, you guys are going bankrupt. You have this humongous pension thing hanging over your head, this public uh, yeah. unfunded pension, pension thing, and all kinds of other problems. And, uh, uh, so anyway, but it's Illinois politics is an endless source of entertainment for us Hoosiers. 
watching the stuff go on, the things you guys, you know, get let people get away with everything. It's just, you know, as well, it's just amusing. Um, anyway, uh, briefly, I, I, I missed what I all said during announcements. I was back there daydreaming or something, and it was kind of noisy. I didn't hear you, but I, but Karina was looking at me, so I assumed you were being, did you, did you say something about Chick-fil-A when you were at the yeah. thing? What did you say? I, I missed it. What did you say? We, uh, what I said is that we are going to um, protest in front of Chick-fil-A on uh, Wednesday. This coming Wednesday? Yeah. Oh, okay. So anyway, you'll notice my Chick-fil-A t-shirt, which I, I bought in support of uh, okay. the, uh, the owner's uh, free speech. Oh. I, didn't, I, didn't have a dog in the, I didn't have a dog in the fight. <laughs> until I heard, until I heard Joe Moreno uh, shooting off his mouth that he wasn't going to allow Chick Fil A into his ward because you know uh, the owner's values didn't reflect his values or Chicago or the ward, the first ward's values or something. Well, that, my friends, is a violation of the establishment clause. That you know the government cannot establish a religion that you must, uh, you know, have your, you know, a, a litmus test that you must pass, you know, that the government sets uh, based on religious beliefs. If Joe Moreno can keep Chick-fil-A out because of the owner's religious beliefs, it, who happens to believe that, you know, his religious beliefs are that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, uh, if... Oh, no, no, that's from no. the last... That's, 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 that's the last speaker. Yeah, he has a minute and a half. He has a minute and a half. So, so anyway, if Joe Moreno can keep Chick-fil-A out because of the owner's religious beliefs, then some other alderman can keep me out because of my religious beliefs, which are no religion. Yeah, that was so, <laughs> so therefore, I had to take the stand that, you know, this guy has a right to say, you know, no matter, like Voltaire said, you know, I may disagree with what you say, but I will uh, fight to the death for your right to say it. So I went to the uh, Chick-fil-A... Uh, appreciation Day thing on on the first, and uh, I'll tell you, it's great when you can uh, when you can support free speech and have a damn good chicken sandwich at the same time. That's a good a good combination. But uh, so anyway, that, I will continue to support free speech, even uh, if it's something I don't necessarily agree with. I am a uh, I've become a classical liberal, as you all know, and uh, so like I really don't care what people do on their own. If people you know, want to marry other people of the same sex, I don't care. It doesn't, neither breaks my leg nor picks my pocket. So I don't care. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, government establishing a religion, then, then, then I have a dog in the fight. Um, I want to mention uh, quickly, sort of related to tips. Last week you made a comment about we need socialism because capitalism won't work for these poor people on the west side, these destitute people and all that stuff. Well, imagine if instead of all these convoluted taxes we had, tips and everything, and sales taxes and all these other different taxes, if we just had a single tax on land, nice and simple, oh, yeah. totally transparent, <laughs> you could open it up and look in a book and see, well, here's this piece of land, here's what the taxes are. And then if we lowered, you know, if we shifted taxes to land and got them off of sales taxes, imagine the boom that would happen in Chicago if sales tax was reduced to some, you know, more acceptable amount, preferably zero, but let's say they drop sales taxes down to even equal of Indiana's of 7%. Look at all the jobs it would create, because people wouldn't be going out of the Cook County to buy their stuff. You know, and, the, and these would be retail jobs that these poor west siders and south siders that Martin's worried about would probably be able to get these kind of entry-level, low-paying service jobs. And it was, but we, anyway, Okay, real quickly, uh, I don't have time. I'm reading Krugman's new book, a uh, fairly new book called Return to uh, Recession Economics. I highly recommend taking a look at that. All right. I'm getting a few jellies tonight. All you people that don't believe in the free tiffs, but usually you're up here believing in free lunch. So, you know, what was the, that's kind of Jurassic's problem. They think, people seem to think that tips are free lunch. And you can't seem to crack that, uh, 
And it was, although he seems to be doing a little better than I'm doing with you, with you guys and your free lunch and unions and all this other stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I heard a uh, alderman say about 15 years ago that tests are a subject or a substitute for federal funding. And I've complained uh, much over the years about federal funding of transit projects being expensive and rigid and the cost is obscured and so on. And then I see just lately where this uh, New Morgan station on the Lake Street line is coming in at $38 million and this new one land for CERMAC is planned to come in at $50 million. So I guess I have to revise some of my perceptions too. I guess we're well, a little bit ahead of you because you seem to be stuck on the same old thing all the time, but uh, at least I can cope with. I wanted to ask him about uh, what he thought of this bus rapid transit, which is kind of a structure. You know, you know, a structured vote is in the Illinois legislature. They, but if they think that they didn't know they're going to win, they let certain parties vote against it without penalty. Although well, this seems, these seems to be kind of a structured transit finance. But uh, now you go ahead and believe it in your free TIF districts. Our speaker had to leave tonight at the end of our question period because of uh, a call from his wife that he had to get home for some reason. So he apologizes that he had to leave early enough. He did ask me to get this this posted as fast as possible so we can see the rebuttals. I told him I would, so I'll try to get this done up and up by tomorrow night. I don't know if the link will be on my website right away because of it, but you will be able to access it through my YouTube account. You can get to that through the link to the College of Complexes homepage. Now, there's a reason why you guys have TIFs in Chicago and McHenry County doesn't. Why Indiana has clean governance and McHenry County has clean governance and Ch Chicago does not. You guys have something called the Democratic machine here. And guess what's, guess what's being dominated in Indiana and McHenry County? We're under Republican governance. I rest my case. Throw the bums out, throw the Democratic machine out, get some Republicans into the city government, and watch how fast things will change and get cleaned up. Thank you. All right, you guys are putting me to sleep tonight. Um, let's see here. First of all, thanks to Karina for putting this together and for, um, where's our, where did he go? Oh, there he is, Tim. And we're trying to get us going here uh, in terms of technology. I know absolutely nothing about local government affairs. I have enough following the feds. Nevertheless, in the time-honored tradition of the College of Complexes, I will give a rebuttal. <laughs> That's not the I don't know anything about. Uh, first of all, about Chick-fil-A, uh, I certainly would not patronize this establishment, nor would I go around advertising the fact that I'm in favor of bigotry. Uh, if you like, I posted it earlier today, I, we discovered on how you can make a Chick-fil-A sandwich in your kitchen without having to go to this place. If anybody wants it, I'll gladly for it. Now regarding tips, as you are aware, I'm, I'm trying to start a, I didn't come here tonight with that in mind, but we're trying to build a New York to Chicago Railroad. And 
you know, now if any of you know the history of the 19th century, there was nothing better for any city of the United States than to have the railroad and a station in that city. And, you know, that I find out that there's, what, a billion dollars available in this regard? And none of it is checked, or there's no oversight on how it's used. Now, oh, we're going to get a beautiful station. A track, and we're going to have union labor, we're not going to use people from illegally, and I mean, it's all going to be union made and all this, you know. But anyhow, if I put in a railroad, and that we're projection, projecting uh, a million some passengers, this certainly would be a benefit to the community. Uh, whether or not, the, and there's something like 165 TIF districts, so I, I'm really going to see my achievement of my dream to become a railroad tycoon, and we're probably not even ever going to leave the city, kind of the boundaries of the city of Chicago. I might like to add, though, there are comments about how wonderful government is, and this is serious. We are investigating this railroad, and we're looking through municipalities, uh, the states of Pennsylvania in particular, oh, Ohio. Right. And oddly enough, the one place that we're having some difficulty in is with the, the rather myopic individuals who operate the state of Indiana. <laughs> 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 no, I'm, it. I'm not certain. But this is an all too intriguing experience with these people. <laughs> Tunnel under Lake Michigan. <laughs> this project is going along really good until we reach Indiana and it picks up once we get to Ohio. And I don't know if we're going to be able to somehow maybe have an overpass or something, I would say, <laughs> through this backward kind of place. <laughs> it's their strange politics and so forth. Um, Nevertheless, uh, the only thing I wanted to add, and the only thing I know about civic projects, so about the city, though, is is that each alderman, the way it used to be, had a project, and all of the other aldermen would vote for it, and they were entitled to one project. This is how we got our public library in Bridgeport, and. We're looking to get some improvements done to it here. Now, TIFs seem to, I don't know if they've taken the place of these projects or not. The projects otherwise are funded in the traditional fashion and things like that through an appropriation of the city council and everything was very public about it. TIFs seem to be perhaps a bypass. Now, certainly there are projects and certainly we've got to look at the projects that already have some benefit. I was curious if the senior housing, I didn't miss that part, um, were, were as a result of TIFs or something like this, you know. Um, certainly, leaving it up to these guys, is are these projects going to be achieved in the most efficient and costly fashion? Highly unlikely. Why places like the, this capitalist mercantile exchange need any money whatsoever simply eludes anyone's logic. Um, certainly the seed of money and things like that, but anyhow, I guess I should discipline myself and follow this a lot more closely. There was an organization that was dedicated here, I'm trying to think, they were involved in transportation. Unfortunately, they've gone out of existence, so I haven't been following it as much as I used to. But they were strongly yelling about this years and years ago, and that was their only uh, reason for existence. Anyhow, where's the speaker? Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. All right. I, too, would like to put in my two cents worth of that Chick-fil-A. <laughs> First of all, the alderman in Chicago has historically the right to deal with such thing, matters as the zoning and so on and to decide what, what projects are coming into his or her ward and what are not. And I didn't disagree when Alderman Rayo said he didn't want Chick-fil-A in there. It wasn't a matter of religious freedom. The Alderman had the right to decide what projects are going to come in or not. And I, for one, will never spend a dime at Chick-fil-A, period, end of story. 
I don't approve of bigotry. If the Alderman had tried to ban a Nazi organization, would the fellow student from Indiana have objected to that? Uh, the bottom line here is this. Our friend from Indiana, again, seems to want to dwell on the world in which the presidents of the United States had names like William McKinley, Benjamin Harrison, and Grover Cleveland. Uh, that's, this isn't the 1890s or the 1880s anymore. Um, secondly, um, no, that's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> I don't like to deviate from the uh, subject usually, uh, but this is, uh, I, I have to, to respond to uh, you, Bob Matter, again. I mean, you were so passionate about uh, the poor bigot who is huh, now discriminated against to uh, have to buy their shirt and, and, and go and protest for them. Um, well, you have strong feelings. Um, I suggest another type of shirt. You know, 16 people are murdered every day around the world because they're gay. That's all. Uh, teens continue to die here being harassed or committing suicide just because they are gay, okay? Um, it's not the free speech that's being violated. It's the right to be that's being violated. Why won't you get an LGBT shirt? All right, is that it? Is that it? Not quite. We got a few more. I want to thank our speaker, uh, but he's not here to thank. Uh, and uh, I don't know that he's going to be able to rebut all these rebuttals. He's promised to email me. Uh, as far as. Uh, LGBT, that's uh, who my church has a little triangle on the outside. Uh, and, and we say that we're welcoming everybody. And, you know, there are a number of churches, uh, about 40% uh, of the uh, United Methodists have tried to change the uh, discipline of the United Methodist Church to approve of marriages of, of gay people and of that uh, gay uh, uh, persons uh, can uh, serve as pastors and uh, so on. Uh, it, there's a lot, there are a lot of people who understand that what it is to be a Christian, and I think probably a good Jew or a Muslim, is to care for people and take them as God's children, God, the expression of God in the flesh. And you see that we are made in the image and likeness of God, male and female, created they, him, <laughs> or her. It looks like that's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. whatever. God, God. So, God, God. Uh, the, the tradition is interpretable and there, there are uh, problems with uh, the tradition, but the force of the tradition is a matter of caring. Caring for people. Caring for oneself. Caring to live and to live fully. And what is it to live fully? Well, when it comes uh, to uh, people uh, having different opinions, yes, you have to tolerate people with different opinions. Most of them. My opinions are, well, I hope, 
tolerated sort of even if, if, if disagreed with. Uh, changing people's opinions uh, is a difficult uh, you, you really have to pray for people. You have to put yourself in their place and try to understand them. And that's uh, the work uh, of, uh, of prayer and, and just neighborliness that we just have to do all the time. That, that, that's just what it is to care, to really be alive. To notice uh, that some people are hurting, or that some people are being very stubborn about something because they, they, something precious is important to them, and they feel it's threatened by something else that somebody else raises. Okay, I think. Well, following the tradition of the. Uh, College, I will not address the uh, topic tonight, <laughs> but I will rebut Brown. And, and we have a, a, a common ground in that we, um, as, as, caring, as people, we, need to, we do need to care about other people. I mean, we're all in this boat together, and we all get by with a little help from our friends and the people who think they pull themselves up by the bootstraps all by themselves are really totally um, out to lunch in terms of being in touch with reality of how things work in a society. However, in terms of religion, I think that you would, that really institutionalized religion particularly operates as a social force and um, to maintain the status quo. And as a social force, it changes over time so that 30 years ago, you would not find any um, churches in support of gay rights or in support of gay marriage. Um, and 100 years ago, you would not find any mainline churches in support of interracial marriage. And, a, and 200 years ago, all the mainline churches supported slavery. I'm so people. as um, I'm burning people, yes. So I'm burning I, them. Well, yes, of course they do support slavery. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. One fool at a time. At any rate, yeah. um, I'm sorry. The whole point is is that to change in order to maintain their base of support and the money to, that people give them to support them, um, they've had to change their their social attitudes towards many issues. That they were really, really profoundly sure that they were all, that everybody was going to burn in hell if they were gay or, or whatever. So um, I think that that it's not from religion that we need to get these values because religion does not have these values. I think that we need to find them within ourselves in terms of the way to treat people in a loving way and in a respectful way. We have to find that within ourselves, not, not from our religion, because a religion isn't going to teach you that if it's not in the religion's interest. Are there any more people desiring to rebut tonight? No, good night. With that, uh, 15 minutes early, we're officially closed. I call this uh, College of Complexes meeting adjourned. Yay.